Hey everyone, this is Mike from vSwitch Zero. So as you can see, I've got a whole bunch of parts on the uh, table here, and this is gonna be my contribution to the slot one build off. So I apologize in advance if my uh, camera footage is a little bit shaky here. I actually just moved and uh, can't find my tripod anywhere, and life's uh, a bit chaotic right now. But nonetheless, uh, I've had these parts for a long time, and um, I've been meaning to put this system together, so uh, as soon as I heard about the slot one build off, I thought this was the perfect opportunity to give myself that extra nudge to finally get this system put together. So my goal with this build is really to create something that's appropriate uh, and true to 1998. Um, it won't be the highest end system that uh, you could find in 98, but it will be sort of representative of a good quality, high performing gaming system that, that you'd find around that time. So I hope to just show you the parts that, uh, that I'm going to be using today. I won't go uh, into the actual build. I'll do that in a, a separate video. But uh, yeah, just uh, show you which parts I chose, why I chose them, and maybe just give a little bit of history uh, behind them as well. So I'll start out with the heart of the system. So this is the Asus P2B, which was actually a very popular board back in 1998. Um, it is based on Intel's 440BX chipset. So it was the first chipset to... Uh, officially support a 100 megahertz front side bus for some of the later Pentium 2 processors that came out. The first generation used uh, 66 megahertz bus. Uh, this board really has everything that 1998 had to offer, including AGP, which was still fairly new at the time. Uh, it has some PCI slots, and of course at this time in 98, uh, P, uh, ISA slots were still pretty popular, so it's great that uh, around this time, you know, they hadn't quite given up on the uh, the ISA bus yet. So this board does have three. A lot of boards around this time will have two, so that's uh, actually a plus depending on uh, what kind of cards you have. Uh, the board that I have here uh, is in pretty good shape. There's a little bit of corrosion on the rear I/O ports, but uh, overall, it's uh, it's in not bad shape and works great. You can see the ports are just sort of the standard thing you'd expect to see. This board doesn't have any onboard sound, which uh, which is great because I don't have to worry about disabling it. But you get a, the usual uh, PS2 mouse and keyboard, parallel port, two serial ports, and uh, the 440BX does support uh, first generation USB as well, which is great. So the uh, board does have a couple of IDE channels, the usual floppy uh, controller as well. You can see that in my board the uh, Connector housings got uh, broken off there. Uh, not a big deal. Everything does work fine. I did want to show this here too. There are some jumper-based uh, front side bus adjustments you can make if you're interested in overclocking. And it actually conveniently tells you what the PCI frequency will be too for those overclocks, which is kind of neat. Uh, the board does support three uh, SD RAM slots. It'll take 100 megahertz uh, SD RAM. I believe it'll take a maximum of 768 megs, which is uh, what the chipset supports. And yeah, overall a great board. I've uh, This is the second one I've owned. I like it a lot. And uh, very well known back in the day for quality and reliability, so I think it's a good choice. All of the caps are still original and in really good condition. And yeah, so let's move on to the CPU. So for the CPU, I've got a couple of options. The one that's installed here now is a Pentium 2 400. It's uh, a 100 megahertz front side bus CPU with 512K of cache memory running at two volts. So this is the second fastest Pentium 2. The last one that was ever made was the 450 megahertz model, but this would have been a very high end and expensive CPU back in uh, 1998, that's for sure. It was released in 98. So this one here you can see has the, well I'll just show the famous hologram here, hopefully that shows up on the video, but that was always the uh, the coolest looking thing. Um, and this one does have the retail cooler, which is great. Um, it does have all of the retention mechanisms in place, so um, not only does it have the normal uh, slot uh, retention mechanism, but it also has these sort of secondary uh, supports here too to hold the CPU in place which is great. A lot of these slot 1 boards that you see now they don't have any retention mechanisms or they're broken or they're not the correct ones and people just remove them and stick the uh, the CPU in but you can start getting some some flakiness if it's not secured properly. So just a little bit of history with the slot style CPUs so um, the, the big thing to remember with the Pentium 2 was that it includes cache memory on the CPU card itself. 
as opposed to having layer two cache on the or level two cache on the uh, the motherboard, which is what uh, a lot of previous generation socket seven boards had. Now, by placing this cache memory much closer to the CPU on a special bus, you can get much higher performance, much higher frequencies than you could with uh, L2 cache that was literally running at the same speed as the front side bus. So this card here, because it's a 400 megahertz CPU, its cache runs at half the CPU frequency. So rather than 400 megahertz, the cache on this CPU would be running at 200 megahertz, much faster than the typical 66 megahertz you'd find in the previous generation. I also have a Celeron Mendocino here. So this is, I think, a 400 megahertz model, but I'm going to be replacing this with a Celeron 300A, which was famous for its overclocking potential. Now you can see this is actually what they refer to as a slocket. Uh, I've heard some people call it a slot key. I don't know why, but I, I call it a slocket. And you can see that it's basically just a socket 370 uh, socket on a card that fits into a slot one motherboard. And this one here is made by Asus and it has the same uh, PCB color as the P2B. So it seems like a good match. Um, these were released originally for the Celerons, but I believe you can actually run uh, certain socket 370 Pentium 3s as well in the uh, slot one motherboards. Uh, so very useful thing to have in your toolbox. Um, this one actually does have a jumper bank here and you can see that there are various voltages that you can set for overclocking. So the 300A was really famous for its overclocking potential uh, because it's a 66 megahertz uh, CPU, uh, 66 megahertz front side bus I should say, and uh, the board uh, natively supports up to 100 megahertz. So in theory you could run the CPU at a higher frequency uh, while not overclocking the motherboard. So that's kind of the goal everybody shot for. So if you could run a 300A at a uh, 100 megahertz front side bus, you'd have a 450 megahertz processor. Very nice overclock. Now, one thing that was really interesting about these Medicino Celerons is even though they have literally one quarter the amount of cache as a Pentium 2, 128K versus 512, because it was on the actual CPU die running at the full processor speed, um, it actually could outperform the Pentium 2 in many applications because sometimes the, the cache speed was far more critical than the amount of cache that you had. So in some ways I've, I've heard uh, of articles and reviews early on that uh, people said that the Mendocino Celerons were actually a little bit too successful. You know, using a 66 megahertz bus was not quite enough of a, a performance difference uh, compared to the really, really fast L2 cache that these had. So for RAM, I don't really have anything too special. These were just two sticks that uh, came with the board when I, when I bought it. These ones are dated 1998, and I believe they are PC 100 megahertz uh, SD RAM sticks, so very typical of what you'd see. These are only 64 megs each, so I'm going to have a total of 128 megs, which I think is sufficient for a system of uh, around 1998. I know a lot of people stick the maximum amount of memory you can in these things these days, but um, at least a smaller amount of RAM like that will be a, a good fit and a little more realistic for what you'd see back in, uh, in 1998. So for the graphics card here, I have a 3DFX Voodoo Banshee. So this one's made by Insonic and dated uh, 1998. Um, a lot of people, when they think 98, they think of the Voodoo 2. That was really the, uh, the highest performing 3D card uh, at the time. Um, but for me, I mean, it, it definitely had to be a 3DFX card, whether it be 98, 99, 97, even 96. Uh, 3DFX was really the king of 3D acceleration at that time. Um, but what I love about the Banshee is that uh, I, think it's, I think it's quite an underrated card, to be honest. Its performance is really good, um, but it was 3DFX's first 2D, 3D core. Um, not, like the, not like the Voodoo Rush that had like a a 3D uh, section and a 2D section slapped together in a single card. Um, this was really a truly integrated chip. Um, it has really, really good 2D image quality. It, I'd argue that it rivals some of the higher end Matrox stuff. Um, it's also great for DOS compatibility. A lot of older games work just fine with it. And I find it also plays quite well with LCD monitors. So if you don't have a CRT, um, I find that the image quality is actually quite good on this one. When it comes to 3D performance, it's still quite good. It's not quite up to Voodoo 2 
uh, performance levels, but it is based on the same technology under the hood. The only real difference is that it has one texture mapping unit instead of two. So depending on the type of 3D rendering it's doing, you might get uh, poorer performance because of that. But it is clocked a little bit higher too, so that does help make up for it in some situations. So this uh, Ansonic model here uh, is dated in 98. It's got 16 megs of memory, which is very standard for a uh, Voodoo Banshee. Uh, it's just got a single VGA output here. You can see that on the Ansonic model, the heatsink is a little more substantial than what you see on some of them. I did add a fan to it. It's really not necessary. Um, they do run a bit hot, and really, I just wanted that there just uh, to prolong its life. These things are getting pretty rare and, and hard to find now, so I just want to make sure I take good care of it. But um, I think this is a great fit for a 1998 system, and it should be able to handle just about anything you could throw at it from around that time. So for audio, I decided to use a creative AWE64 value. So really, uh, really, really popular late model ISA card from Creative. Um, this particular value model, I saw a lot of back in the day. I had one. I know probably a lot of you did also. Um, they had a gold model as well, but it was very expensive. Um, so you didn't see too many of them. Um, I decided to go with an ISA card because I know around 98, um, there, there was quite a shift in the industry to move towards PCI for audio. And um, some of those early P uh, PCI cards were just fraught with compatibility problems, especially if you played older DOS games and things like that. So I really wanted to uh, stick with an ISA card. Um, and really this, this one, I mean, just about everybody had this card. It was very, very popular. Um, it was released, I believe, in 97, um, but you know you saw a lot of these in 98 as well, so I thought it was a good choice. It doesn't have genuine OPL3 for uh, FM synthesis, but um, it does have Creative's EMU chip, uh, as well as, I think, 512K cache on board, so you could do some wavetable stuff if you're interested. I'm probably not going to mess with that, but um, it's a good sounding card, good compatibility, and overall I think it's a, a great fit for this build. I wasn't originally going to put a network card in here, but I do have this Intel Pro 100 card. I believe it's dated uh, 1996. Very typical of what you'd see around that time time period. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be going on the internet or anything with this machine, but uh, it is handy uh, just to be able to copy files over or to do quick uh, FTP or things like that. So I haven't quite decided what I'm going to do with storage yet. Um, I have this uh, Fujitsu drive, which is the closest to 1998 that I own. Um, this is a six and a half gig uh, drive dated 1999. I have a couple of these that I got for free in a case that I purchased and they both seem to be working. Um, I don't remember how loud it was. Hopefully the bearing noise isn't too bad. If the bearings are, are, are okay, I'll probably try to stick with it. It'll be nice to have a uh, mechanical drive for that more realistic nostalgic feel. Uh, otherwise, I do have both uh, Compact Flash and SD card options um, that I can use as well. I do have 32 gig cards of both types, so that's the maximum the P2B BIOS will support. So I'll, uh, I'll figure out what I'm going to do with that, and uh, we'll be using one of these solutions here. And last but not least, I have the case here. So this is an AOPEN case. Uh, I believe this one has a manufacturer code of 1999, but these were out in uh, 98 as well very popular case at the time. I actually did own one of these back in the day. Um, they're very, very solid, thick steel on them, uh, good quality, and just a really nice, simple look to them that, uh, that I like a lot. This one uh, isn't very yellowed, um, so that's definitely a bonus. It has a, uh, an AOPEN 300 watt power supply in it that I tested and seems to be working fine, so we'll, we'll go with that for the build as well. For the optical drive here, um, this is a 50 pin SCSI drive, so I'm going to have to try to find an IDE drive. Um, I like this one because it looks very simple, but uh, if worse comes to worse, I'll just uh, use a DVD ROM drive. Not what I would like to do. It won't be uh, from 1998, but at least it'll work. It's kind of hard to find older working optical drives these days. The floppy drive is just a standard 1.44 floppy. And of course, we have the mandatory 3DFX sticker. So great case overall, and um, I think it's perfect for this, uh, this build. So anyways, that's it. Um, hopefully you enjoyed this video, and I look forward to putting it together.